That'd be great. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Christine Curry and I'm the Iowa Outreach Coordinator of the Isaac Walton League's Upper Mississippi River Initiative known as UMRI. Welcome to our 2022 series on soil and water conservation, thinking like a watershed program. The monthly presentations take place at 7 p.m. Central Time. They are jointly hosted with our Isaac Walton League colleagues of the Upper Mississippi River Initiative. Co-hosts this evening include UMRI's Minnesota Driftless Coordinator, Caroline Van Shake, and Des Moines Chapter Communications Director, Bud Hartley. And thank you both so much for all your continued support. And thank you everybody for taking time to joining us this evening for another extraordinary presentation. Championing the Upper Mississippi River region, how a lifelong conservationist became an advocate for the Mississippi a league president discusses conservation and change. This is with our guest this evening, Mary Ellen Miller, president of the League of Women Voters Upper Mississippi River Region. Mary Ellen is a conservation activist and a self-proclaimed tree hugger. This evening, Mary Ellen will share the league's connection between advocacy, voting, and the state of the river. She will discuss the work that members are involved with to improve soil health and water quality and how they are working with others in the Upper Mississippi River Network to take action for change. And thank you again, Mary Ellen, because I know uh, you've had so many technical uh, challenges this um, the last couple of days and this evening. So I'm, we are super grateful to have you with us this evening. And I'll let you say a few words and then I will help with the sh um, with your presentation, so thank you. Sure, if you could throw up the opening uh, PowerPoint, Christine. Sure. And Christine's right. Um, I know a fair amount of the people on tonight are Iowans, so you know that those of us down here in Wayne County, Iowa, had quite a tough time with the tornadoes that came through. Um, I was fortunate. Um, the clouds parted, and the tornadoes went to the south and went to the north of me but a lot of neighbors in a whole lot of hurt. And of course, we all know that we lost seven to eight lives. Um, I am very near Red Haw State Park that got hit pretty hard and wiped out its campground. My good friend is the park ranger there. So I know she's been very busy the past couple of days and lost a camper. And in addition, it totally destroyed the Lucas County Conservation Board Nature Center at Pin Oak Marsh. So uh, uh, we're all kind of still reeling from the damage. Um, I think I need the first slide, okay. Christine, here on the second or third one. Right there, there right? Okay. So I wanted to just, as we get together and think about the river and think about uh, the work that all of us are collectively doing in terms of caring about the river. I'm kind of a geology buff and I found this piece that I thought kind of would be a good prelude to what we're doing tonight. Uh, back in 96, Public Radio in Iowa celebrated 150th birthday by a bunch of vignettes about Iowa. And this was a short one on farming and I just took a bit of it out but I wanted to share it with you tonight as kind of a frame for where we are. And you'll understand more as I go through my talk about why I consider this important. But this chapter on farming, tilling and tiling the soil, it's hard to imagine the landscape that greeted 19th century newcomers to Iowa. Our collective memory often chooses to forget the reality of the difficult, even treacherous land. But while pioneers may have rhapsodized about the sweep of prairie with its rich earth, dense plants and abundant animals, they also despaired of vegetation too dense to navigate and soil too moist to plow. To early settlers hoping to tame the prairie, one of the most striking and challenging features of the Iowa landscape was the abundance of semi-permanent wetlands. 
Christine's going to be our slide person here. Trying to, uh, there, let's see, did it go? Oh man, what's going on? It's not letting me, it's not letting me move for some reason. There. Here we go. So in 1869, an editor of the Iowa Homestead wrote that Iowa sloughs were notorious from Maine to California. Although perhaps suffering from both pride and a tendency to exaggerate, the editor's general points well taken. 150 years ago, and this was of course written in 96, much of Iowa was wet. The Wisconsin glaciations, which occurred 13,000 years ago, created poor natural drainage patterns in north central Iowa. Much of the land shaped by the glacier lay wet for long stretches of the year. A farmer who settled on the moist prairie land was forced to plant his high ground first, only okay, later during thank you. his large land for cultivation. Between 1850 and 1875, the tools and techniques were creating okay. artificial drainage. Thank you. Food. Have a good and night. Farmers were able to put Bye. their entire acres into Bye -bye. crop. Thank you. Uh, we need somebody to mute. Uh, some somebody needs to mute. Thank you. If the Iowa farmer of the 80s, 50s, and 60s drained his land at all, he drained it by digging a few ditches with a plow and shovel. By the late 1860s, farmers inclined to the innovative might have experimented with new fangled tile drainage systems but water removed from one location is destined to end up in another. And more often than not, that destination was the property of a downslope neighbor. To properly drain one piece of land and not flood another, an entire network of surface ditches and tile-lined drains had to be planned and constructed. My grandfather was in the business. He actually built a big drag line and created a lot of those drainage stitches. I'm here to talk to you tonight about an effort by the Iowa Women League of Voters focused on water quality, water quantity, and the Mississippi River. But I would be negligent if I didn't give you just a little backstory on the League of Women Voters. First of all, the League was officially formed in 1920. That was the year that President Wilson signed the amendment to the Constitution giving women the right to vote. So the story of our creation and purpose was led by an Iowan. Carrie Chapman Catt was the founder of the League, but she prior to that served as president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. She'd been asked to take over the leadership of the suffrage movement at the turn of the century the movement ran a total of 72 years so that the women who started it certainly didn't live to see their success. But the League uh, was formed by Kat and Kat grew up on a farm outside of Charles City, Iowa uh, because once the president signed the amendment giving women the right to vote, she turned around and said, now I think it's important that women are educated voters and so formed the league. So the basis of the league is mainly set up to educate women to vote and also to ensure that women knew how to register to vote. So we're all grateful for that. The current president of the National League, the League of Women Voters US, happens to also be an Iowan from North Central Iowa. That's Dr. Deborah Turner, who grew up in Mason City. Could you go back one slide, please, oh. Chris? Oh, let's see if I, ah. Uh. I'm sorry, this is my- Now you're oh, gonna have go. to go back three or four. Okay, there. sorry. Okay. One more forward. Sorry. Oh, one Hold more forward. Back. Okay, right there. Here we go, thank you. Okay. So you'll see in the next slide pretty soon the structure of the league, but uh, the leagues are formed probably not too unlike the Isaac Walton League in that we have local units and then we have a state board that the local units are part of. And then we have the National League. 
But in the 70s, it became apparent that some of the issues that the League were discussing really crossed over political and geographic boundaries. So we were allowed and are allowed to set up what are called inter-league organizations that cross those boundaries. So if you go to the next slide. So here's kind of a graphic showing you, there says the League of Women Voters at the top and underneath that are four boxes that you probably can't read, but those are the four states that make up the upper Mississippi River region, which we affectionately called Ummer. So it's the leagues in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa. We did invite Missouri to join us in this effort and they declined. We hope someday they will. But this interleague organization covers the upper Mississippi region, mostly the navigable part from the Twin Cities down to St. Louis. Uh, and of course you can see the map there that it encompasses. So we were formed our first convention was in 2015. So we're a pretty young organization. And at the bottom of the graphic, you can see why uh, one of the points I wanna make is about this effort is the number of league members that we can reach. And in fact, we're not reaching all of them in all of these states. Both Wisconsin and Illinois are parts of another interleague organization that's focused on Lake Michigan. So when we look at the number of local league membership in Illinois and Wisconsin, that's not the full amount for the whole state because a lot of those units that are closer to Lake Michigan are involved with that ILO and not with us. But the point I wanna make here is simply that we have an opportunity to reach out to almost 7,000 league members in this four state region. And that's to me a pretty significant number. The other point I want to make is I'm a unique member of the league in that I'm a rural member. And most of the league across the country really are made up of urbanites. Here you can see the Lake Michigan region ILO and you can under, understand why parts of and they are on the river. So I'm going to go to the next slide. So Mission for Ummer is to engage the regional residents to, again, to make them informed voters, stewards of the river, and to be well informed about ways that we can protect the river. So most of our work does focus on nutrient pollution reduction, but we also focus on other things that pollute the river. More recently, of course, PFAS has been a pretty strong uh, emphasis on our part and just in general, reducing the rate of climate change. We're concerned about both the surface and the groundwater in the upper Mississippi basin, both in terms of the impact on the environment and also our human health. You probably can't read this, but this is just our plan of action. Uh, again, educate ourselves and our fellow citizens about issues that we identify that they can advocate for either in their local communities or higher. We do have uh, a thing called the watershed game. And it actually is a tabletop game. It was defined at the University of Minnesota. One is the adult version and one is uh, elementary level version, but it's actually a game that covers pretty much a top of a table. And it's used to engage people at events to show them different things that they can do or maybe shouldn't be doing that impact the river. And so the other thing, of course, is we provide and collaborate with all efforts in our local leagues. So quite a broad outreach. And you heard last month when Kelly McGinnis was here, the executive director of the Mississippi River Network, and we're a member of that, that a big focus we all have right now is trying to get the legislation called MIRI passed, the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative. They didn't ask me, I would have tried to figure out a way to make that shorter, uh, but it is co-sponsored or sponsored initially by Betty McCollin, a Congresswoman from Minnesota. And I know that Kelly did a good job of covering the elements of MIRI uh, at the last meeting. We also work with a lot of groups, both uh, governmental, but a lot of environmental groups like the Ikes and we'll talk a bit more about that toward the end of the presentation. 
This is just a quick look at some of our recent programs. Uh, we meet, we have five programs um, by Zoom each year, and then we have a major program at our annual meeting in person if we can get back there this year. Uh, they're all recorded and they're all available on our website on the bottom of the screen. And this is just a look of what we've been covering in the last few months. Uh, Alan Goubert, who I think most of you know, because the league is made up of mostly urbanites, I asked Alan to come and talk about why 50 years of the federal farm policy brought us to this point where we are today because a lot of our members are not connected to agriculture directly, and many of them not even indirectly other than eating. And so we're clueless about that. Uh, Jackie Armstrong is gonna be doing a presentation for the Des Moines League later this month, but she did it for Ummer on a climate change simulator that was developed at MIT and a couple of other institutions, which if you haven't had a chance to use it, it's accessible online, you can just go on, but it's a wonderful simulator of if I do this, how does it impact the current level of temperature on the earth? And if you can see, then you can also set the level of temperature that you want to reduce it by. Uh, Betty McCollum, of course, last year came and talked to us about her initiative uh, to provide a work um, federal support for cleaning up the river. And this initiative is really not a funded initiative. It's a collaborative initiative. And we hope it's also modeled after the initiatives that were used to clean up Lake Erie and the Chesapeake Bay. So we've got a model to work with. We're hoping we can move that through. Uh, mentioned earlier, the unfolding issue just dramatically in the last year of PFAS in our water supply. And I've recently seen that in addition to it, not only being in our drinking water, but now they're discovering that it's actually in our bodies and in the food we eat. So kind of a scary development, uh, forever chemicals they're called. And in one way, Iowa seemed to be maybe safe or safer from these because we don't have gigantic military bases, but apparently there's still a lot of use of the fire prevention foam training at all of our airports. So it is now apparent in almost all of our water supplies. Dubuque is Iowa's only sustainable city so far. They've had a lot of unique programs put in place to conserve water, to manage the water, to take the polluted water and prevent it from getting into the river. Quite a good example for communities all up and down the river. And of course, my old pal, Dave Osterson, Osterberg came in just to talk and give kind of a, a background on the whole issues of nutrient pollution of our waters. So uh, we we're always glad to hear from him. Next slide. The next set of slides are not gonna be exactly new to most people in this group, maybe to some, but again, the emphasis I wanna make is that our focus is on educating league members in urban areas. And so for a lot of them, this is new information. Although more and more people, of course, today are aware of the dead zone and also the fact that the nutrients that flow into there, a lot of them come from the upper Midwest because of our vast numbers of acres growing corn and soybeans. And so this has been a major contributor to the Gulf of Mexico and the impacts down there. And this just mentions that, of course, I was a huge contributor to that, mm -hmm. and not only to the Mississippi River, but also to the Missouri River, which eventually will end up in the Mississippi. So 55% uh, of the nitrogen going into the Missouri River and 45% flowing into the upper Mississippi River Basin. Of course, Illinois is a huge contributor as well. So again, I'm going to go through these pretty, go back one, Chris. Okay, so uh, I thought. Pretty quickly, but just some uh, data. Some of it's old, some of it's new. Um, but just to point out the value of the river, when we talk to uh, communities along the river, it's a major transportation area. A lot of our agricultural commodities are shipped on the river. 52% uh, of our corn, 41% of our soybeans uh, leave the Midwest on the river. Eighteen national wildlife refuges, 
285,000 acres. States manage another 140,000 acres. Next slide. Huge, of course, recreational impact. Um, more people than visit our national parks. Approximately 500 boat access points and marinas on the upper Mississippi alone between the headwaters and where the Ohio comes into the Southern Illinois. Seven billion gallons of water are withdrawn from surface water sources each day in the 60 counties that border the river. More than 80% of this water is used as cooling water for energy production and return back to the river. There are 29 power points use water from the 1300 mile long river. From St. Cloud to north to Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the south, the Mississippi River provides water to 23 public water suppliers, serving a combined population of almost 2.8 million. Approximately 278 facilities discharge wastewater into the upper Mississippi River. This includes industrial facilities as well as municipal facilities. 30 million people live in the basin. Nearly 80% of the population lives in urban areas. Again, this is why I see the league carrying a, a, a really big heavy load here in terms of educating our urbanite members uh, about the value of the river. 12 major tributaries, most of you know this, 30, over 30,000 miles of streams. Over 60% of the basin is cropland or pasture. Of course, main crops are corn and soybeans. This is all, but the picture doesn't change a whole lot over time, but just again, to show the urbanized the impact of agriculture on the river. So this is soybean acres. Next one will be corn. So the upper Midwest, you can see why the emphasis mm -hmm. is here to really look at nutrient reduction. 40% of Southern Minnesota lakes are undrinkable, unswimmable, and unfishable due to excess nitrogen. And you all, most everybody here knows about the issue at the city of Des Moines and having too many high loads of nitrogen because they take their water out of the Raccoon River mostly. Um, and most of us here know that I was home to the dirtiest streams and rivers in the US. Again, this is data mostly familiar to most of us, but not to league members. So what is this about excess nitrogen in the water? Again, you can debate the numbers, they might fluctuate a bit, but essentially most people agree that about 70% comes from farm fields, mostly from our drain tiles. That's why I opened with the article. I started with because Iowa didn't have those drain tiles in there naturally. Uh, there were things that homo sapiens put in but the runoff from the crops uh, planted closely to waterways, of course, is a significant impact. Uh, the guess is 20 to 30%, and I think we've got some pie charts coming up later uh, from urban, residential, and industrial runoff. So you've probably seen some of these, but essentially the point being, if you look at cropland, groundwater, cropland, tile drainage, and cropland runoff, uh, you're looking at almost two thirds uh, of the, the, that area being responsible for the nitrogen source that goes into our water system. And just, uh, we try to emphasize to urban people that there are things that they can do, uh, living in cities, plant more living cover, plant rain gardens, et cetera, et cetera. But there are small things, because everyone wants to know, what can I do even if I'm not a farmer uh, increased uh, habitat for insects and wildlife. Um, take pay more attention when you're planting the lands. Those sorts of things. Well, I'm going to spend a lot of time on it, but we have more slides that we share with urbanites. And I mentioned earlier that we do have a fair number of collaborators in the area, and probably more than this. We have what's called an action committee report. So my board is made up of two board members from each of the four states plus uh, four officers. So we're 12 people. Each of us 
probably overlaps one or two or three of other organizations involved in the environment. And so we are asked to serve somewhat as reporters. Uh, and it's a two-way exchange. We share with them what we're doing and they share with us what we're doing. We, of course, work very closely with the Mississippi River Network as one of their members, as well as with the Upper Mississippi River Basin Association. And of course, many here know about the Land Stewardship Project from Minnesota. What we have is each one of our board members sits as a liaison to these different groups. And I know we have several people that are involved with the Isaac Walton League in all four states. So this is uh, the last slide. Uh, the league takes on this challenge, uh, committed to helping uh, residents of these watersheds be better informed about what's going on in their own backyard. And we hope that this will have a ripple effect so that they share that information within their local league units, they share them with their friends and neighbors, and then in turn become activists in each of their states for water quality. I love this quote, I can't remember who gave it to me, but we all know our zip code, our area code, we all should know our watershed HUC code. And that's a hydraulic unit, unit code. And for the Mississippi River, that code is 07. And then each sub reason in each basin has another code. So you can always just look those up if you're curious about what HUC code you live in. I think that's the last one. Okay, and I see your contact information is uh, available. Is in the bottom there? Yes, yep. and also the um, website has a recording of every program that we've done. So anyone is free to go in and share those recordings, look at it. You can share them with your own organizations. Uh, they're totally open to everyone. So if you're interested in seeing um, what David Osterberg had to say, uh, that's up there. Um, one of these days, I hope to get Chris Jones to come and talk to us and share some of his uh, information as well. I'm gonna go ahead and reach stop out. Sharing. And uh, if, you want, if you're interested, we also have a founder who does quite a good job at blogging on our website about these issues. The PFAST uh, session that we did had 160 people on that uh, webinar. It was just quite amazing. So I'm pretty sure that that's being shared far and wide as well. That's fantastic. We will share that on uh, UMRI's uh, website as well. That will share a link to that. Yeah. So I don't know if there are many questions. Uh, I'm going to look in the chat and see what's going on here. Car here I'll, Caroline. Do that. I'll do that for you, Mary Ellen. OK, so the issue, though, is Mary Ellen, can you hear me when I say the question? You know, Caroline, you're very hard for me to hear. All right, Christine. Okay. Yes. Okay, so you all please bear with us while we um, do some translating here. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway. All right. So Mary Ellen can hear Christine better than she can hear me. So Mary, Christine, I'm going to give you the question and then can you say it again out loud? Sh sure. Absolutely. Let me, um, this won't be in any order, you guys, just as I've okay. made notes, but uh, Mike Delaney, of course, has so many good ideas and his latest one <laughs> here is for you, Mary Ellen. And he says it. Um, you guys should be a co-sponsor of the Raccoon River Watershed Life in Conference that's coming up in April. And you can have a table and it sounds like it's probably going to be free. So I'm going to say, Mike and Mary Ellen, you can talk together about that afterwards, but there's a good idea. But Mike also had a question a little earlier, and that is, um, does Ummer ever collect Mississippi River data? <laughs> Yeah, that's a question we get a lot. And we do not in ourselves engage in that. But I do know that there are local leagues, especially in Wisconsin, that are involved in water collection systems. But the league itself, as far as I know, hasn't really signed on to any of that. Uh, maybe it's something we could look at in the future. I saw too that Mike mentioned the Museum, I assume you're talking about the museum in Dubuque, Mike, maybe? Yeah, and I can speak for museum. myself. Happy to. <laughs> Thank you, Mary Ellen. Great presentation. I love that picture of the paddlers. And the paddlers, yeah. Wow, yeah. I, you know, I'd love to have a copy of that one. They're on the Raccoon River 
<laughs> I'm not yeah, on the board, but, but I helped to put together the conference on April 9th and Matt Liebman and Tom Rosberg and Peter Levi are going to have tremendous information for us. And uh, I'm just thinking, you know, those groups that are really interested specifically in our rivers uh, should be invited. Uh, and should be invited to set up a table and we don't need any money. I mean, it's all paid for the buildings free and we're not really spending any money. So it's not like I'm looking for money. I just think putting people together is the only thing that we can do. <laughs> we don't have any power. We'd be, happy to, you know? yeah, we'd be happy to do that, Mike. I think one of the issues we have is we've only got, I think, two display table tabletops and uh, our national league meeting is coming up um and i suspect it's on its way to denver uh but uh, i can check and see april 9th i could see if we can get something in iowa for that yeah. we can yeah. we'd certainly be happy to set up a, a tabletop display uh -huh. and somebody asked about can we measure how consuming less meat would possibly impact the watershed boy mary that's a that's a big question, and I'm not sure anybody has that answer yet. My assumption is, well, yeah, it probably does have some effect, uh, but is anyone actually measuring it? I don't know. But we certainly know that confinement animal feeding operations uh, can contribute a lot to the excess fertilizer on cropland. Um, so yes, I would think any lessening of meat consumption could probably have some impact. Well, at least less consumption of confined, confinement, conventional production meat. Um, if you choose to eat meat or even a little meat and you buy it from a farmer who is pasture-based and managing his, his or her pastures with rotational grazing, then you are actually contributing to many positive things, including keeping soil and nutrients out of the river, which my goodness, we could do a lot more around in that area. But exactly. when you ask about me, I really want to caution people that you must um, clarify that you're talking about confinement raised meat, not pastured meat. It's really, really a different beast. I mean that literally and figuratively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is a little bit of a segue um, as well. Um, I was wondering about... Um, Mary Ellen, you talked about how most league members are uh, urban, ba urban resided, but many of those um, people own land that they are managing uh, casually or otherwise out farmland. I mean, we call them NOLOs, non-operating landowners. Um, what sort of, does Amr address that population in any way? Do you get particular questions from, in your programs from, people who are um, not operating landowners, but living in cities? There are programs for that. Uh, I will just tell you from personal experience, I probably know almost every league member in Iowa. Uh, I'm guessing a handful that might actually own farmland um, just because of okay. what they're attracted to. I will say we have a lot of retired teachers as members. And so that's when I saw that we don't have a membership, at least in Iowa, that really is familiar with farming and especially crop farming, but also livestock farming. But to give you actual numbers, no, I don't know. But I just know that okay. we, in Iowa, we do not have a lot of ag land owners. There are organizations, and in fact, I think there's a meeting coming up uh, for non-operating landowners. I, I think it's maybe a joint state meeting. I thought I saw something. Anyone else know about that? I think it's coming up this spring. No low. And it may be a, a, an effort in Wisconsin. But we that's another big issue. In the other part of my life, I'm a soil and water conservation commissioner. And that's a big concern to us. Uh, as how do you reach those non-operating landowners? Um, with information about conservation without land stewardship. It's really hard to reach out to them. Some of them are out of state even. M many of them are indeed, yeah. Um, that is a that is a whole nother land. Well, you are, um, a, you are a landowner yourself and a farmer. I don't know exactly whether that's past tense or present tense. Um, what, what's, you, you knew I was gonna ask you this because I warned you already to, um, <laughs> 
just spend a moment uh, connecting some dots for us between your farming background and where you are as such an avid and deeply knowledgeable river advocate. Yeah, it's a, I'll make it a short story if I can, but I grew up in the 40s and 50s on what I call conventional or traditional farming where we literally raised all of our own food. Um, my parents, I think, bought flour, sugar, and coffee in town. And we took in eggs and cream and butter and, you know, it literally, we raised pork and beef and all of the chickens and turkeys, everything that we ate, big gardens, fruit trees. Um, I bought my first farm in the mid seventies. I had no idea uh, about the economy. I said, all those years going to college, I took the wrong classes or else they didn't teach me what I really needed to know. But in the, in the middle of the seventies, I decided I needed to do something about investing in my future and decided what did I know about? So I knew about farming. So I bought a, a farm in small farm in Northern Washington County, South of Iowa city. And for 20 years, almost 25 years, I raised custom organic black Angus beef calves. I ran my own herd, I raised my own hay and corn. I was the only woman farmer in the county. It was very challenging. And I would get questions like, um, what do you mean you want a mineral block that doesn't have any hormones in it? What? What do you mean you're you're not giving your cows antibiotics. What are, you, what are you doing out there? I mean, they just all thought I was crazy. But the interesting thing was it was just at the time when hog confinements were starting. Every banker in the universe was taking me out to breakfast, lunch, and supper and saying, we'll build you a confinement. We'll convert that barn, Mary Ellen. You don't want to raise cattle. You want to raise pigs. Mm -hmm. I grew up in 4-H in that neighborhood. And all of my 4 h -er friends were out there farming with their big tractors and their CB radios and uh, paying an enormous amount per acre for land when I, I couldn't pencil it out. But I had rented a farm for three years, raised and finished the beef. I knew exactly what I wanted to sell. And I, the first year I just gave away some steaks I never marketed and I never could raise enough beef. There, the customers was there. I was told it was impossible. Well, no one will pay that premium price. I said, people will pay for quality. And also I know people wanted to know what was in their food. Now that was the seventies. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it was kind of uphill from day one, but I also grew up in a community that really valued conservation and caring for the land. And my grandfather came out of an Amish community and the ethic was you really are, it was much like Native Americans, you really are just a temporary steward. You really don't own this. So this idea that we own the land and it's only there to take out the, of the resources, uh, what we need and what will make us money is really abhorrent to me, but we're kind of in that frame right now and we're paying the price for it. Um, so in retirement, I inherited a small farm in South Central Iowa. And the only story I like to tell about this is when I was a little kid, my mother was from Southwest Iowa. My dad was from Southeast Iowa, from Kelowna. And we would go back and forth uh, to visit. And Highway 2, where I live now, was Gravel Road. But 34 was a two lane. And we'd trek over to Red Oak to see family. And we'd get right to the middle part of Central so Southern Iowa. And my dad would go, and I say, what's wrong, Dad? What's wrong? He said, hard scrabble farming here, hard scrabble farming. And I say, why, Dad? And he said, poor soil, no water. And I know that my parents are just up there, especially my father, laughing that in retirement, I'm living in hard scrabble farmland. And the, the blessing is things are different today. We know more, we can do more. And I live on the world's, I'm told, the world's largest rural water system, the Rathbun rural water system, because there is no subsurface water. Uh, but uh, so that part is improved. Of course, if I want to water my orchards, I have to pay for it. Um, so I have huge natural water collecting system on my farm. Uh, but uh, in retirement, I find myself back on the land. Um, Mostly my work is uh, focused more on agroforestry, on orchards, both nut and fruit orchards, because the land is good for that. 
And also I'm interested in growing local food. So, uh, and I'll just put out a plug for silt. My farm is a silt farm. Uh, I was the first farm donated to silt, Sustainable Iowa Land Trust, if people don't know that. Uh, but the emphasis is on sustainable use of the land and growing local food. 90% of the food Iowans eat is imported. And yet we claim we feed the world, which is just not true. We can't even feed ourselves. And to me, that needs to change. Mary Ellen, uh, Lori Cox gives you a hats off for your story. And she had also asked earlier who you work, who Ummer works with at LSP. Are you okay sharing a name or two with us all? I'm not sure I can hear that, Chris. Um, it's Lori gave you a nice compliment about your story. And she had also asked earlier about who Ummer works with at LSP, at Land Stewardship Project? No, I don't know. I'm not the, the liaison to LSP. I suspect it's one of our Minnesota board members. Okay. All but right. I can certainly find that out. Do I get that information to you? Uh, yeah. We, you can. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I know that our Hang on, we'll get an uh, answer activity card has a name on there for somebody. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, any, any other questions, either ones that I've missed from the chat box or Mary Ellen has missed or that someone else, you're welcome to just simply unmute yourself and put it out there. What about the amount of farming required to feed animals? Well, again, I think uh, Carolyn made the point that um, I'm not going to advocate for veganism or vegetarianism here or pescatarianism. Um, I'm a meat eater, but uh, my meat is mostly venison from those critters that roam my property and chew on my trees. Uh, but I buy my pork from Chris Peterson up in North Central Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, and I buy my chickens from a local grower who grows them free range and organically. So mm -hmm. I think if you're going to be a meat eater, certainly my view is uh, do what Chris, uh, Carolyn said is uh, find a local grower who is growing them uh, appropriately and sustainably. Uh, we have, and actually not far from me, we have one of the largest buffalo herds in Iowa. I don't know if people know that that exists, but Lucas County has uh, a gentleman that's been growing, I think, buffalo for 30 some years now. And so there are people that are growing, I think, meet appropriately and healthfully. And certainly for South Central Iowa, where I live, quite frankly, and I'm very vocal about this, um, I couldn't figure it out when I moved there, people were knocking on my door and wanting to rent my pasture. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want to get into that. And I just was not paying close attention uh, until one day it dawned on me, it's $8 corn. And what dawned on me was that my neighbor across the road that had a beautiful pasture ripped it up and it's too steep. It's not appropriate land for row crops because it's very hilly and rolling. And also it's not quality land. So he's got to put a tremendous number of inputs into that. Uh, but I've been down there about 12 years now and I can remember in the first part of when I lived there, I was still working in Des Moines and I could go work in Des Moines for three days and come home and an entire farmstead, I kid you not, trees and everything would be gone. Buildings, everything gone to gain another five acres to grow $8 corn. It's heartbreaking. Uh, we've got whole mile squares now with nobody living on them. And so it, $8 corn and who knows where it's gonna go this year. Uh, dramatically changed our countryside in Southern Iowa, not for the best. Uh, I don't know what it'll take to turn it back to where it should be. And of course, $8 corn is mostly grown on in a fence row to fence row situation where the ground is bare for seven to eight months a year. And that means that that soil uh, runs where it doesn't belong and it carries uh, fertilizers and other nutrients into the very Mississippi. Well, in addition, as I mentioned, my father's story, and I always like to tell that because the kind of soil we have is not the kind of soil you really should be growing corn and soybeans on. It isn't high quality, it's high clay, uh, makes it very hard even to get a cover crop in. 
because of the moisture that it holds. So it's either too dry or it's too wet. Uh, we do see a fair amount of aerial seeding just because of that. Uh, yes, everyone would like to do cover crops, but if you actually go out and talk to some of the farmers, it's, it's almost impossible to do on this kind of soil and this kind of terrain. And so that's why I say, I hope at some point we can turn that land back into hay and pasture for livestock the way it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now it's very sad, it's very sad. Uh, fence row to fence row is still happening. Remember Earl Butts, get big or get out. Yeah. Uh, there are no fences left in uh, Iowa. Uh, I remembered a gentleman writing something in the Re Des Moines Register recently said, I can't believe it, there are no animals. There are no livestock. He drove up I-35 he said, there's no livestock. Said, That's right, they're all in buildings. Yeah, behind the trees. <laughs> it's a huge transformation of our topography and certainly not healthy. Mary Ellen, um, this is a good segue actually. Um, one of our participants named Tanya Kack is, says she's new here. And I think she basically wants to know the connection between Ummer, the four state Ummer, which sounds really great to her, and how you push a legislative agenda. How effective are you legislatively? Can you huge, huge. Uh, that's a main focus of the League of Women Voters. Uh, people misunderstand us sometimes and say we can't be lobbyists. Yes, we can. We're citizen lobbyists. And that's the whole point. And that's why I like to tell a story about Carrie Chapman Cat. She wanted women to be educated voters. And we take it pretty seriously. So we do a lot of in-depth study. We have position papers that we conform to. But yes, it, we that's why I said we've got, what, is, what was the number? Just almost 7,000 just in Ummer. Uh, turn those loose on your state legislators and your federal uh, uh, congressmen and senators. And we're very active in that. Um, one, of the, one of the functions of the league that we don't talk about much anymore, but originally is hugely popular is what we call monitoring. And that means showing up at public entities, school boards, supervisors, councils, legislators, whatever, but where you actually sit and listen and report on what they do, almost like a journalist, but you're reporting back to your fellow league members mm -hmm. to say, this is who we need to talk to about this issue. Uh, so lobbying and activate and really actively advocating for the river is a huge part of our work. And so Mary Ellen, if, um... Uh, oh dear, what was her name? Tanya, if Tanya wanted to- Subsidies, so don't get become, me started on subsidies. Okay, I'm with you, I'm very with you. But could Tanya contact you, Mary Ellen, about uh, maybe joining the league or participating with the UMRR in some way? Absolutely, I don't know where Tanya is, what state Neither. she's in. Um, what I can do is- um, I'm in I Iowa. You I mean, I, <laughs> information back up. I, hi, Tanya. I, I will go ahead because um, I always send out a link to the program um, with uh, the, recording. the recording. And mm -hmm. and I will put um, Mary Ellen's contact information again in there. Um, Thank you. In the email. Absolutely. I should have this. Uh, it's, it's usually within a day. I have I have that information. We have 12 leagues in Iowa. We're the smallest one just because we're the least populated. But um, uh, I mentioned I'm, Dubuque and um, uh, can oh, you tell just, me where you're from? I'm, I'm in Des Moines. I'm actually- um, Oh, you right? can join my league. You can join the I would Moines. love to. I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm a graphic designer, but I'm actually doing a master's in in sustainable design too. And oh, cool. I just, yeah, so I just, you know, want to get more involved in the water. Tanya, we have a brand new website for the Des Moines Metro League of Women Voters. Take a look. Um, we'd love to have you join us. I would love and, to. Yeah, uh, it's a yes. great league. Thanks. Um, and Christine, if you could send me that info, that would be great. Absolutely. And we'd love to have you um, as part of our Isaac Walton League, too. Uh, okay. We're, we're, we're going to get you signed up all over the Yeah, place. we're going to get you involved <laughs> in the, Give me in the raccoon. In I, I think we've run, we've run over the time quite a bit, but yes. uh, note to Laurie Cox. Uh, Laurie, you can also reach out to me. Uh, I, I'd love to talk about 
why we should not be subsidizing these crops the way we're subsidizing yeah. them. But it's a long conversation that many of us are having. I do think right now, this is the only point I'd like to make. With the current administration, with Tom Vilsack sitting as head of Department of Agriculture, this is an opportune time for us all to be really working hard to change that subsidy system. Yeah, exactly. Mary Ellen, we are so um, appreciative of you taking the time to share your story. I do. Part of my and, job. And you are just an amazing person. I, I've been, as I mentioned before, when I when I got to meet you, I'm like you were on my bucket list of people to meet. So I am so grateful for to have you in our state and for all the work that you've been doing. And uh, man, you think we should make some progress, but we just need to share the stories, continue to share the stories and amplify the exactly. voices. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you for inviting me, fun to be here. Thank you. Thank you everybody. And um, we'll be in touch. All right, good night thank all. You. Good night. Bye. We'll see you next month. Okay, sounds great. Thank you.